Apocalypse, we coming to the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse again. And last time we tried to establish the identity of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet mentioned in verse 13. And we tried to see them as they have appeared in the Apocalypse and then by linking it to Daniel to show the latter day application as it will be prior to the coming of the Lord. But we left you with the thought last time as to why the false prophet is separated for the first time in the Apocalypse from the beast. If you remember we'd seen the beast in chapter 13 as being the Holy Roman Empire with the mouthpiece being the papacy itself. But now as we've come to contemplate the 16th chapter, although we can clearly define and identify the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, we want to just consider just for a moment why the false prophet is separate from the actual beast. And if you remember when we went over to the 17th chapter, we see again that this false prophet, this time identified as the unchaste woman, the prostitute who rides the multicolored beast, we find her again separated uh, from the actual beast. Clearly identifiable with it, supported by it, but separate from it. Now the reason I believe uh, that to be the case is because of what has happened in the previous uh, verses of the 16th chapter. Remember the vials were to begin to see the overthrow of the Holy Roman Empire. That two-horned beast which was like a lamb but spake as a dragon was beginning to collapse and crumble mainly through the exploits of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte until the Vatican itself obviously was at the mercy of Napoleon. And it was from that time and forward to 1870 when the Pope and the papacy lost all its temporal power. Since that time it's been an influence it's been obviously a power to be reckoned with, but it never had authority directly over the nations and countries as it had done previously. So whereas once it had been established, first by Constantine and then by Charlemagne, it had the total support and control over the countries which obviously were under its dominion. Since the 16th chapter has come on the scene, the Vatican has just been a one-mile square city. It never has, since the time of its loss of its temporal power, had direct control over the countries of Europe. And therefore it is appropriate when we see the 13th verse of the 16th chapter that although it's still got a mouth speaking great words of blasphemy, it is not incorporated with the beast. As we have said, it's linked with it, it's supported by it, it's got a lot in common with it, but it is separate from it. The papacy does not have direct control over the countries which are identifiable with the beast, because the Holy Roman Empire has ceased to be. And therefore I believe it's for that reason that in the 13th verse of the 16th chapter we've got for the first time in the apocalypse the false prophet, the papacy standing apart and separate from the beast community and again for the same reason as we come to the 17th chapter the woman although riding the beast to show that she is still supported by the countries of Europe nevertheless she is distinct and separate from it. Someone at the door, um, please. Oh, you, you it's not locked. Okay, 16th chapter of the Apocalypse, uh, verse uh, 13, Simon. Okay. So that's the reason I believe that the false prophet is identified separately from the actual beast, as we've said, uh, supported, connected, very much linked with it, but now a separate entity on its own. And of course that we see in the politics of the world today. It's got its own uh, uh, authority, it's got its own papal state, but it is separate and distinct 
from the peace community of Europe. But the thing which these three have in common is in verse 13 that these unclean spirits come out of the mouth of both the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. And these unclean spirits are spoken of in verse 14 as the spirit of devils. And the word for devils is demons. And it's the word which we identify in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles when someone was uh, declared either a lunatic or was insane and the master cured him of his illness and we remember the devils departed from him and of course it was a mental disease but as far as the um, Greeks and the Romans of that time were concerned they saw these demons as actual gods which had possessed the man. Now, we know that's not true. It was a mental illness of some sort or another. But they were looked upon by the people of that time as actually being gods, which had power over a person to be able to afflict all these terrible things upon them. And if you remember, the master uh, cured uh, many of, these, um, uh, of this illness when they were possessed of devils. It's the same word in verse 14 same word as we read throughout the gospels and in the acts the spirit of devils the spirit of demons now the interesting point is that madness was always associated with that type of disease it always rendered them insane or they did some very peculiar and strange things and of course the master himself was uh, accused on one occasion as being the, the possessor of such demons. Now, just think of the context of the 16th chapter. It's speaking of these unclean spirits. And these unclean spirits are the spirits of demons, the spirit of madness, the spirit of mental disease which takes over a person. And these have come out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Now, can we go back to the prophet Jeremiah? Because right the way through this 16th chapter, we have used Babylon in the past as a type of what's happening in the future. And we have seen in the way that Babylon was overthrown in the past, is a type of the way that Babylon the Great is going to be overthrown in the future. Now in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah, obviously it's a chapter which is dealing with Babylon. We can just look at um, verse 1 of Jeremiah 51. Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind and the whole of the 51st chapter of Jeremiah is the judgments of God against this nation of Babylon but I want you to come down to verse 7 Babylon hath been a golden cup in Yahweh's hands that made all the earth drunken the nations have drunken of her wine therefore the nations are mad because of the influence of Babylon and its effect upon the nations with whom she had to do, the nations are being declared as mad. Now if you've got a marginal reference, you will notice it takes you back to the 25th chapter of Jeremiah. And again, if you come back to Jeremiah chapter 25, you will see again the same idea brought forward by the prophet. Again, speaking of the Babylonian power, and in verse 15, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. 
they shall drink, be moved, and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Now, both of them are speaking of the influence of this nation of Babylon and the effect it had upon the other nations. And the context of both chapters speak of it as being a golden cup in her hand, full of wine, full of intoxicating liquor, which is handed to the nations, they have drunk it, and they have gone mad as a result. Now, bring that thought forward to the 17th chapter of the Apocalypse. Now, if you consider verse 2, where, of course, it's the judgment upon the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, says verse 1, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And you'll notice the connection, particularly in verse 4, that the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and she was entitled Mystery Babylon the Great. Notice the identification with the cup and the why that is intoxicated the people with whom she's had to do. Now, if you bring that thought back to the 16th chapter, you've got the same idea being conveyed through these three unclean spirits which emanate not only from the false prophet but from the beast and from the dragon they are the spirits of devils the spirits of demons the spirit of madness which are working according to the authorized miracles which are going forth to gather the whole world to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And the word for miracles in that verse 14 is the word sign, or a mark, or a token. Now again, if we think back to the Gospels, I'm sure you've heard many times, and you've probably conducted your own study, on the eight signs of John's Gospel. They are spoken of in the Gospel as miracles but we don't speak of them as the eight miracles of John's Gospel. We speak of them as the eight signs. It's the same word, miracle, sign. And it's the same word here in verse 14. And it's this spirit which emanated from the French Revolution, the spirits of liberty, equality, fraternity, the spirit of democracy and communism, which is emanating from the mouths of both the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which are causing the nations to become mad and intoxicated with the doctrines which they are producing and preaching, which causes them to gather together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now we want to develop that in just a few moments, but can I take you back to Daniel chapter 3? So I want to take you back to Daniel chapter 3. Now, again, it's a story which you'll be very familiar with. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, in chapter 3, first of all, built the image, which everybody is supposed to bow down to, and then, of course, we have the rejection of it by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, of course, they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and then they were uh, taken out of it through the power of Almighty God. Then we find, when we come to chapter 4, that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Now, this dream was different to what we see in chapter 2. And he saw a dream which, again, troubled him as the other one had had. And in verse 10, we are given the details of this vision. 
the visions of his head upon his bed were these and he saw this tree which grew a great height until it reached unto heaven and of course then he saw it being hewed down and the branches being chopped off etc etc we know the details now Daniel gives him the understanding of that dream and then we come to the end of the fourth chapter when all these things have taken place that Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months in verse 29 walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon and the king spake and said is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty while the word was in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying O King Nebuchadnezzar to thee it is spoken the kingdom is departed from thee now that had been the substance of his dream in the earlier verses they shall drive thee from men and this is the interesting point I want you to notice and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and seven times shall pass over thee until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and we know that what exactly had been decreed came to pass because in that very same hour says verse 33 was this thing fulfilled he was driven from men he did eat grasses and oxen his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles feathers and his nails like birds claws so Nebuchadnezzar became an animal he acted like one he was mad he was doing things which obviously any man in their right mind would never do and this man was doing it obviously because of the words that had proceeded from his mouth now there's an actual disease which uh, Nebuchadnezzar is supposed to have uh, got here it's a mental illness and again perhaps Alan can uh, authorize this but it's called lycanthropy lycanthropy and apparently it's a man when he imagines he's an animal and acts like one and it's an actual mental illness true right so it's an actual disease which he had a mental disease which caused him to act like an animal now the interesting thing about this is in verse 32 is his dwelling should be with the beasts of the field and he would be in this state of madness until a particular time and that is in verse 34 and at the end of the days I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High and I praised and honoured him that liveth for ever and ever and we find in verse 36 at that same time my reason returned unto me and for the glory of my kingdom mine honour and brightness returned unto me so Nebuchadnezzar was stricken with madness until we are told verse 34 at the end of the days his reason returned and he blessed and acknowledged the God of heaven and that's exactly what Daniel chapter 3 sorry Daniel chapter 4 tells us now when you consider when we go to Daniel chapter 7 we've got the nations of the world paraded for us in Daniel chapter 7 as beasts beasts of the earth and Nebuchadnezzar was enacting a symbology that he was as the beasts of the earth before God he was suffering this insanity 
until the end of the days and at the end of his days he acknowledged the God of heaven now there is no doubt in my mind and I'll put it no stronger than this that Nebuchadnezzar is a candidate for the kingdom of God because the last thing that we read of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 was a wholesale 100% complete confession and repentance profane history also records that his burial was a very humble one he left specific instruction that he was not going to have all the pomp and circumstance which befitted his position as monarch of the kingdom of Babylon it was a very simple humble burial and profane history records that he had changed from being this self-conceited and proud man into a very humble and contrite one and therefore on the evidence that we're given in the scriptures at least is a candidate it's up to the Lord Jesus Christ obviously to give the account as to whether the repentance was true or otherwise but the point was he was mad until the end of the days and it's significant therefore that the nations of the earth are portrayed as beasts before God now bring that thought back to the 16th chapter and again the nations of the earth as identified by the dragon the beast and the false prophet are seen as emanating from them this spirit of madness which will bring all nations to the battle of that great day of God Almighty it's the frog-like spirits of communism and democracy which has caused the nations to be in the state of flux as they are today now we don't really need to go to Luke 21 but let's just go to Luke 21 but I'm sure you can repeat the words off by heart well in verse 25 the master says there shall be signs in the sun and in the stars and in the moon and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and even the political commentators of today will try and diagnose that certain situations are happening because the world is in a state of madness they are going to and fro until it comes to the climax of the battle of the great day of God Almighty now we can speculate we can have our own thoughts as to what has caused that the apocalyptic writer is suggesting yea telling us that it was the frog-like spirits which is emanating from the dragon from the beast and from the false prophets these spirits of demons which are working these wonders these signs these miracles in order to bring the whole world to the battle of that great day of God Almighty now just think back for a moment we've seen a lot of the papacy during our study of the apocalypse since its concept in apocalypse chapter 6 with the uprise of Constantine we have seen the ebb and the flow of this papacy as it has come through all the various stages down the uh, history of time now if you remember Constantine became a champion of the Christian cause but very quickly because some would not agree to his uh, authority and the edicts which he pronounced they were soon excommunicated and the papacy has built up this aura that if unless people conform to what they believe then they are quickly put out of the way now I don't know if any of you have heard the news this week about the papacy's visit to India and there has been this sort of uh, alarm 
amongst the Sikhs and amongst the sort of hierarchy of the religion of the East as to the Pope may be trying to convert the populace to Christianity. And he's there on a 10-day visit and his very first words was that he had not come to convert because he was prepared to acknowledge the God of any nation. Now it's almost unbelievable that the Pope would acknowledge that fact. Now there is no grounds at all in the basis of their beliefs for that at all to be said. And yet the Pope is going round this world as the ambassador of peace, kissing the ground, trying to identify himself with the countries and the peoples throughout the world, whatever their cultures, whatever their beliefs, whatever their uh, persuasions are as far as his particular religion is concerned, he's going throughout the world as this ambassador of being all things to all men. Now we know that that is not a papal doctrine. Unless you conform to the strict rites of the Roman Catholic religion, you're excommunicated. And yet here we've got their head going all around the world, now joining forces with the Archbishop of Canterbury for a day of prayer for peace and trying to get all churches of whatever persuasion they may be, whether they be Hindu, Buddhist or whatever, all joining together in a common end, one of peace. Now again, we might take this as being just part of the ordinary day scenes of what's going on. Now what we've got to appreciate, it is all fulfilling Bible prophecy. Because the scripture says that at the end of the day, we are going to see the resurgence again of this Holy Roman Empire, where we have the, the papacy as the ecclesiastical system joining forward forces with the communists, with the military system, in order to be that metallic image at the end of the day, and if you remember we saw last time from Daniel 8 and from Thessalonians, by peace they will destroy many. And it's the spirit of delusion. They are trying to get the world into this state when they think that there is no harm in what they are doing. He's a good chap. Look at all the wonderful things that he's doing. He's going round and blessing all those who are sick and all that sort of thing. Now again, we are not knocking his own sincerity. That is up to God to judge. All we are saying, it is totally against the dogma and, and beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church to encompass within their own organisation other outside religions. And yet he's going around the world doing exactly that. Now again, you think of the new chief in Moscow. You think, and even the papers made a, a, a great play about it, with that terrible tragedy, and of course it was, with the shuttle being blown up. Now within half an hour, the Russian newspapers had not only printed the story, but were sending their condolences and their offer of grief to the bereaved families from the actual Russian government. The, the, um, the president, uh, the, the, well not the, the, the president because obviously that's uh, slightly different, but the head of state as we know in, in Russia has prepared to scrap all nuclear weapons by the end of this century. He has said to Reagan already, he is prepared to, to get rid of 50% overnight if Reagan will do the same. Now we all know that the scriptures are telling us that the great Russian bear is going to come down upon the Middle East to try and take world control. And yet, they're giving this air of being peacemakers, of trying to get the people to say there's no harm in what they are doing. It's not them who are causing the unrest. It's not them who are causing the turmoil. It's not them who are causing wars. And people are gullible enough 
to accept what is being said and therefore they're being deluded and it's this spirit which is emanating throughout the world and we are, can see it with our own eyes and that is the very thing which verse 14 tells us will cause the whole of the world to gather to the battle of the great day of God Almighty it's the combination of the nations of this world to the battle of that great day of God Almighty now if we can just take one last thought before we go on to verse 15 can I take you back just for a moment to Daniel chapter 8 just so that we can underline once again this spirit of cooperation which is existing between these powers at the end of the days and it's in Daniel chapter 8 and in verse 25 and we've gone into the details so I'm not going to repeat them but through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many remember Paul's cry to the Thessalonians when they shall cry peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon this world the apocalyptic writer speaks of it as being the spirit of madness because it is mad that the nations are deluded to the point of thinking that these powers are seeking peace and in the very seeking of the peace it will bring destruction upon this world the spirit of madness the spirit of cooperation as they are trying to to voice throughout this world will delude the people into thinking that everything is okay until sudden destruction comes. but you'll notice at the end of verse 25 he shall stand up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken without hand now in the times of the apostles in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ there was only one cure for the illness which is called demons or devils and the cure lay in the power of the Holy Spirit invested in the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles we can look at the Gospels and the record in the Acts and there was only one cure for the lunacy of the individual and that was the power of God and so it will be again that the nations of the world will not come to their senses like Nebuchadnezzar didn't come to his senses until the end of the days and when God's judgments are in the earth then the inhabitants will learn righteousness it's only when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to take away the madness which is enshrouding this world will the nations be healed and they will acknowledge the God of Israel so what Nebuchadnezzar did was a type of what all the beasts of the nations of the world will do they will eventually acknowledge the God of Israel but unfortunately tragically it will only be when the Lord Jesus Christ is in the earth to take away that madness now if we can come back to the 16th chapter during this build-up and we want to just pause during this build-up for more things we're going to say because if you'll notice intervening between in, be, between verses 14 and 16 we're gathering them to give the battle of the great day of God Almighty we find in verse 16 he gathered them together into a place called in Hebrew tongue Armageddon in this intervening time the master says behold I come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see shame now it's before 
the nations are brought to the battle of Armageddon verse 16 brings them to Armageddon it's during the build up as they are being gathered towards the battle that the master says behold I come as a thief now I'm sure none of us here need to be reminded but unfortunately some do feel that we can wait until Russia comes down into the land of Israel before we shall see the appearance of Jesus Christ that is not scripture the scriptures plainly tell us that during the build up of verse 14 as the spirit of devils the spirit of madness which goes forth to the gather the whole world to the battle during that time before they come to Armageddon Jesus Christ says behold I come as a thief now again we hardly need reminding but let's go back to Matthew 24 Matthew 24 verse 36 of that day and hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only as in the days of now so shall also the coming of the son of man be and here's the exhortation from the Lord in verse 42 watch therefore for you know not what hour your Lord doth come but know this that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh in an hour when you think not the son of man cometh now he is not speaking here to the world he is speaking as verse 1 tells us to his disciples and he's answering questions from his disciples and he's saying to the followers of Christ as they will be at the end of the days just prior to his coming you know not what hour your Lord doth come and it's a time when you think not the Son of Man cometh now if you go to Luke chapter 12 you again have a very similar exhortation from the master when he exhorts in verse 35 let your loins be girded about and your lights burning you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching and in verse 40 be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when you think not now again speaking to his disciples he comes at an hour when you think not now the reason for stressing that is on the basis of what we've got in the 16th chapter of the apocalypse verse 14 has told us of this great build up at the time of the end as the whole world is being brought to the battle of God Almighty and at that time he says behold I come as a thief now if we were just reading the 16th chapter of the apocalypse and not had the benefit of the gospel records one would say that the disciples of the master would be in a very excited anticipating state just waiting for their master to come they're seeing all these signs these miracles being worked by the nations of the world as they see the culmination of what the prophets have spoken about in bringing the determined purpose of God to fruition and therefore one would assume that the disciples of the Lord 
would be seeing these things as they go on in the world, day by day, week by week, year by year, as they're all building up to this great crescendo, until eventually they will come down upon the Middle East. And during that time as they're building up, he says, Behold, I come as a thief. And therefore, you would think, there is no need of any warning to the saints, to the disciples of the Master, that they would not be ready and prepared for his coming. Now when you consider the hundreds, yea thousands of years which have gone by, and then suddenly, in the last a hundred years, the whole thing has been coming together, and we have witnessed sign after sign after sign after sign, which are not only speaking, but are shouting that the Master is coming, the Master is nigh. You would automatically consider that the disciples would be ready and prepared. And yet the Master says, at an hour when you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now can I take you back to Apocalypse 3? <coughs> now here's the exhortation which the Master gives to Sardis and notice the phraseology which he uses I know thy works verse 1 that thou hast a name that thou livest but art dead be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou shalt not watch I will come upon thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now again, the Master was speaking specifically to that ecclesia at that time. But as we saw when we considered chapter 3, all these letters are applicable to all ecclesias of all ages. Now this is particularly significant in the way the phraseology is brought before us appertaining to Sardis. He is speaking of a thief-like advent to Sardis. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If thou therefore shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief. Why were Sardis watching? Why was the Master expecting Sardis not to be watching? If he had warned them, which he had, that if they weren't ready and prepared and watching, he will come as a thief and destroy me, why weren't the ecclesia of Sardis on the edge of their seats awaiting and watching for the coming of the Master? to take away, as it was at that time, the light stand of the Ecclesia. Well, the answer, of course, was seen in verses 1 and 2. Thou hast a name that thou livest, but art dead. Now, a dead corpse can't watch. It's got no senses. It can't see. It can't hear. It can't even smell. It's not alive. It's dead. And the Master said of Sardis, you've got a name which says you're alive, but you're dead. Now, his exhortation to them was, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God he even tells them what was causing their death <coughs> they had let 
go of the truth. If they hadn't have done that, why was he exhorting them to hold fast, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die? Those things which they were now being exhorted to strengthen was the only means which could keep them alive. Otherwise, they would die. And a dead corpse cannot be awake and watching for anything. Now, it's a similar exhortation, if you remember, going back to the Epistle of Jude. He says in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was necessary, needful, for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now again, there was something very urgent in the words of Jude. It was necessary for him to reawaken their awareness to strengthen the things that remain. Because they, like Sardis, were ready to die. And then he goes on to explain why. There are certain men which had crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness, and denying the only God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They were turning the grace of God into license. That's the idea of lasciviousness. And by doing that, they were denying the very God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, Jude is saying internal divisions were causing the ecclesia to die. People in their midst were preaching license instead of truth. They were preaching that they could let go of the doctrines which they had espoused. That they could afford to have a foot in both camps, to use an expression. That the world was not such a terrible place. Now, it's exactly the same principle, and because we know it so well, I want to try and underline this by going back to the book of Genesis. And I want us to go back to the third chapter, and I know you're going to say, well, this is so simple Sunday school stuff, but there is a point. Remember the serpent tempting the woman, and the woman... First of all, when the tempter said, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden, verse 1, the woman gives a very, very good reply as to what she should and should not be doing. And then the serpent said, Ah, but that's not true. You will not surely die, because God knows that it's really good for you, because you'll know good and evil. So what was the serpent suggesting to Eve? Well, he was suggesting that the consequence of eating the fruit was not necessarily evil. Contrywise, it could even be good. That's what it would say. The consequences are not necessarily evil. Now let's take it on the strict basic logic of Genesis chapter 3. The one point, the one command which God had placed upon them, thou shalt not eat of it. The serpent was suggesting, oh well, really, you don't have to strictly uphold that commandment. There's no real harm in bending that commandment in order to advance your knowledge. 
How will you know what it's like until you taste it? And he was suggesting to Eve that the consequence of eating that fruit was not necessarily going to do her any harm at all. Now you can go through the epistles, brothers and sisters, and you can choose anyone you wish to take. And the warning of the Apostle Paul, of Peter, of Jude, of James, anyone you care to mention, and more so the Lord Jesus Christ, he is saying that people will suggest, circumstances will suggest, that the influence of the world is not necessarily evil. We don't have to be that separate, chaste community that our old pioneers preached. Well, that was Victorian England. You know, the world's moved on a pace since then. We don't have to have the same moral standards we don't have to have the same clinical approach to the Word of God like those old-fashioned brethren did. The consequences of this world are not necessarily evil. We can afford to read out and taste and touch and handle because they're not really going to do us any harm whatsoever. Now that is what corrupted Eve and you don't have to take my word because you know it's a fact. That's exactly what corrupted the ecclesias of the first century. Now the wise man Solomon said the thing that hath been is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. And with the greatest respect I would suggest that our community today is no different to the communities of past ages. And it is a fact of life, brothers and sisters, that Malachi tells us that God changes not. The standards which God has set are maintained completely on a level. And therefore the standards the followers of Christ should maintain are equally as constant. Now there are many more wiser brethren and sisters in this room tonight than me. And they've certainly gone through the experience of life far longer than I have. But can we, any of us, say that the community today is stronger than when we were first baptised? With all the advancements which have taken place in every field of this world's activities, is the truth and the standards of the truth as stronger or as strong today as they always have been? Or are divisions, attitudes, morals, and whatever else you want to mention, declining rapidly? I don't think it's without coincidence that even the Christadelphian magazine can see certain problems in the fact that they are calling for a special meeting. Now, whatever the virtues for and against such a thing as that, everywhere the declines are obvious. Now, we can probably see them in our own life. We can probably see them in our own standards. The things which we allow to die may be 10 years, 15 years, maybe when we were first baptised, we would never ever have thought of. Because we have convinced ourselves, or have been convinced of others, that the consequences are not necessarily evil. We're strong. We can rise above these things. The fact that we spend all night being amused by the world is of no consequence, because we still come to the meetings. The fact that we can get involved in other activities which have got nothing to do with the truth, really, we're strong enough to combat this. Now, we can take these exhortations personally, brothers and sisters, to any length that we want, because we've all got our own particular ones. But what I want us to do is to come back to Revelation chapter 3.
I mean, verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. And if you don't watch out, I'm going to come as a thief and you're not going to be aware of it. Now that warning, brethren and sisters, is the warning of the apostles. It's the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ. At an hour when you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now again, I might be repeating, I repeat it purely for emphasis, like things I repeated in the scriptures. I came into the truth in the Six Day War, not during, but at the time of the Six Day War. Now I can remember, as I've probably said before, the town hall in Birmingham was bursting at the seams. People were being turned away, not in their ones and twos, but hundreds. Because the community was alive and it was vibrant, because we were all expecting the Master to return. People who had got wedding dates planned were wondering if it would ever going to come, because the Master would be here. We've seen the Six Day War come and gone. We had Yom Kippur. We've had the invasion into Afghanistan. We've had all these things, and again, you can enumerate them as I can. These things have been signs as God has been bringing the nations to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. But as the community got stronger as they have seen the day approaching, or our internal divisions, strife, people suggesting to us that we can touch and handle and feel because the consequences really won't harm us. And the Master seems to be suggesting, brothers and sisters, it's because we are looking inwardly. It's because we are more content with looking after ourselves, making ourselves comfortable, looking after our own ends, not being over-concerned. It really doesn't matter whether we've got all these problems in the brotherhood. It doesn't really matter that divorce and remarriage is now so prevalent. They're nice people. Why should we be so hard and fast? Why should we judge our brother? And we hear all the excuses, brothers and sisters, and I've only chosen that one, I could choose many, many more, and you could tell me scores more than that. All I'm suggesting, brothers and sisters, is that the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ is that in the midst of this build-up to the battle of the great day of God Almighty is going to come at an hour when we think not. He is not going to come at a time of great crisis in the world. He is not going to come when something dramatic is causing us to be there awake. He is not coming when we are prepared. Unless, as the exhortation from Matthew and Luke was, that we look to ourselves, we hold fast to that which is good, we strengthen the things that we remain, and we are ready and prepared ourselves. How long have you got, Joe? One minute. Right. I'd like to read, if I may. Have I got time? Not really. You want to stop there? I'll just read that. Well, I want to read an article. It's not by a Christadelphian writer. It's by a chappie called Erdeshim Alfred. And he wrote a book concerning the temple its ministry and services as they were at the time of Jesus Christ. And what he did, he took the Temple of Herod, and not only did he give us all the structure and all the other details and that, but what went on, how it was organised, who was looking after what, what duties were performed, and so on and so forth. And he speaks of this in the context of Apocalypse chapter 16. And I'd like to just read this. A written copy of the article is enclosed with this tape. And what this chappie suggests is that the master was using the very incidents of the day, the things which were happening in the temple, to describe his own coming. Now the interesting thing of that is on the basis of what we've got in the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse, when after warning us 
that behold I come as a thief the master says blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments because as this says if they came and found him asleep they would set his garments on fire now the point of stressing this is the exhortation from the master to each one of us in the midst of the build-up as the madness of this world will come to its climax in the midst of it not when it's reached it but as it's coming up towards the battle of the great day the master says behold I come as a thief we shouldn't brothers and sisters need the warning if these signs are in abundance which they are which are telling us that the master is about to return the build-up of the